Fast Lux crew. Building a diverse and talented team should be a priority for any aspiring designer. Diversity strengthens creativity, fosters an inclusive space where unique backgrounds and experiences intertwine to produce groundbreaking outcomes. Recruiting team members with specific skills and expertise can compensate for any distinct weaknesses, guaranteeing all areas are sufficiently handled. And that is just one of many topics our guest, hair and makeup designer, Pippa Woods, is passionate about. Pippa shares her insights on the importance of finding team members with a positive attitude and willingness to learn, as these qualities cannot be taught. She also emphasizes the need for team members with specific skills and experience to fill any gaps in expertise. Our conversation delves into the importance of mentoring and nurturing team members, as well as effective communication and providing as much information as possible. Now, before we kick into it, I want to let you know the podcast will have a small little break over the holiday season, but we will be back January 8, 2024. But if you're missing us, you can always head back in time and go right back to the beginning and see if there are any you may have missed. Or maybe you've already listened to every single episode. And if that's the case, you, my friend, are a Last Looks listening legend. Well done. But we will have one fun event before the 8th of Jan, and that is our next live Q&A event with the legendary Mark Coolier on January 6th. So the link is in the show notes so you can get your ticket and submit your questions. Oh, and use the discount code LASTLOOKSPOD, all one word, LASTLOOKSPOD, to get your 40% discount. Be there or be square. And one more fun thing, I have been slowly but surely organizing, and that is our Last Looks Mentoring Program for 2024. Guys, we have so many incredible mentors lined up for you, all past guests of the podcast, and all so graciously giving their time to whichever lucky mentee is chosen and paired with them. So be sure to keep an eye out for the details for that coming in the new year. Woohoo! My name is Jamie Lee, a film hairstylist from Aotearoa, New Zealand, living in LA. And this is the Last Looks podcast, a show where I catch up with hairstylists and makeup artists working in the film and television industries around the world. And today we catch up with hair and makeup designer Pippa Woods. On with the show. And now, a word from our sponsor. Are you ready to Elevate your textured hair education. Introducing Zemera Pro Tools and our revolutionary mannequin head, Nakai, the ultimate tool for mastering the art of Afro textured hair. With 16 inches of 100% human hair, Nakai is not just a mannequin head, it's your canvas for creativity. Watch as it shrinks and stretches like natural hair, giving you an authentic styling experience. Color it, perm it, heat style it. Nakai can handle it all. Perfect for braiding techniques. And explore endless styling possibilities with a mannequin head that's designed for you. The hairstylist, the educator, the enthusiast. Zemara Pro Tools is not just a brand. It's a commitment to excellence in the hair industry. Join us in revolutionizing hairstyling on Afro textured hair. The future of textured hair education is here. Unleash your creativity and master your craft. Order your true to texture mannequin head at zemaraprotools.com. That's Z-E-M-U-R-A ProTools.com And now, our feature presentation. Picture up. Last looks. Rolling. And action. Welcome to the Last Looks podcast, Pippa. Uh, Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. It's my pleasure. Okay. So this is where our story begins. I want you to finish the sentence for me, okay? Yeah. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Pippa, and when she grew up, she wanted to be... 
she wanted to be everything. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is my, I mean, sometimes my problem in life, but other times the thing that's kind of helped me along the way. Mm. I think I was, was very lucky growing up in that my parents, you know, if I, one day I wanted to learn saxophone, they were like, sure, let's get you a saxophone and get you some lessons. And then the next day it was like, I want to do ballet. And so they kind of installed this thing in me that if there was anything that I wanted to do, I could just go and do it. Yeah. And that's really helped with our industry because obviously, you know, you need to be able to do everything. Mm. But Oh, I could never decide what I wanted to do. I still can't decide what I want to do. You know, I sit at home at the moment and I'm thinking maybe I'll just start growing veggies in my back garden and just sell them to local farm shops, <laughs> you know. And but I think that's kind of what keeps everything so interesting to me, you know, especially in our industry, because you can just always find something new that you want to get your teeth into. So yeah, I gosh, I wanted to I wanted to be a vet at one point, but I would have never made it through that many years of medical school. I would have got so bored. I I wanted to go off and direct stuff. And then I wanted to, oh gosh, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to travel the world, making cocktails and things like that. But uh, when I was growing up, I used to do a lot of kind of musical theatre stuff. Yeah, I was going to go off to university and do kind of film production. And my mum kind of said to me, oh, um, why don't you take a little year off, do a little gap year or such. And um they're doing kind of auditions for the Disney cruise. You know, you could go and be a dancer on that or something. And I was like, yeah, sure, let's do that for a year. And um, audition for that and never got in. Mm. But um, it ended up leading me to Disney in Paris, where I ended up working for a year. And that kind of started off my journey on makeup. And doing what at Disney in Paris? So I was dancing in the parades. Um, I was also doing some of the characters. So I did Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty and loads of the characters who were in the big costumes as well. Um, my first parade when I got out there was in a heat wave in the middle of summer in Paris. And mm. I was in this Pluto costume and I oh, never experienced heat like it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was doing kind of characters and things. But obviously, as a dancer and doing the princesses and things, you have to go through hair and makeup and they show you how to do it. It for the first few times and then you have to do it yourselves but I remember going in there and just seeing these rows and rows and rows of wigs you know they're all proper kind of synthetic you know huge fringes on them kind of mm. wigs but there were these rows and rows of wigs and they'd open a drawer to give you your makeup for that character and it was just I think it's my obsession with collecting things and having lots of different things but all the same you know they just had these rows of lipsticks and single eyeshadows and all these foundations and I just thought wow what is this world that I've come into and we used to get discounts in Makeup Forever and Paris Berlin kind of as performers as such and I just used to spend all my money on makeup and just started doing makeovers for everyone when we weren't at work and um, I just completely fell in love with the makeup department. They have some of the kind of bigger characters like Maleficent and Cruella and Snow White's Evil Queen. Mm. They're almost kind of big drag makeups, you know, they're huge huge eyeshadow looks and everything and even some of the parade characters when they have clowns and things like that the makeups they used to do were stunning and I, I look back at pictures now and I still think they're some of the most beautiful makeups yeah. and I just kind of said to them you know if I go and do a makeup course can I come back and work here and they were like yeah sure whatever and um yeah so I came back to do a makeup course and um, never went back to Disney but um <laughs> I can always go back one day I suppose it's not going anywhere <laughs> That's so awesome. So, but were you when you while you were doing other people's makeup, were you into doing your own as well, or was it that you just wanted to do it on other people? I n no, I never did really. I mean, if there was, you know, oh, if someone says we're going to a party and there's a theme, I'm mm. like, right, everyone out of my way. This is yeah. serious, you know. <laughs> like, I can't just, I can't just do like a basic something for a fancy dress party. You know, I'm there making huge feather costumes and things like that, and yeah. you know, I'm planning it for months, kind of thing. So. I'd love that creating those characters and becoming those characters for the night. So I'm actually going to a Barbie themed party tonight and, you know, obviously have gone all out, still deciding whether I'm going to do a full wig or not. I'm not sure, <laughs> which is so extra. But um, And so for things like that, I like doing it on myself. But at the time, I loved just doing kind of transformations on people. Yeah. And it was all because... Um, 
someone had given me one of Kevin O'Quan's books. Mm. And of course, there's all the before and afters, aren't there? And it was just, it was just these beautiful, I suppose, full beats where, but you'd kind of look at the before and after and you'd go, that is magical. And so I was trying to do the same thing on these, on my friends at Disney. And, you know, I'd get my cam, my little disposable camera out and I'd try and get all these images and stuff. And so I was kind of trying to do my own little Kevin O'Quan book. <laughs> <laughs> in awesome. our little dorms at Disney, you know. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so when you're saying that you went and did makeup training, so you went back to England to do that? Yeah. So um came back to England. I'd been there for a year. You know, my French wasn't really good enough to do it over there. So I came back and did it back over here. And it was I won't say where I went because it wasn't great. Um, mm. It wasn't one of the big makeup schools. I just didn't have the money. And my parents were very kindly supported me through so much of it. I've been really, really lucky in that respect. But I just found a little college up in North London uh, yeah. that wasn't, it wasn't a makeup course really. It kind of did kind of beauty and media makeup and a bit of hairdressing or whatever, but it was a year. It was like the first year of a degree. Okay. And, you know, the tutors weren't working in the industry really. It was all quite behind the times. I mean, we were being taught to fill edges of prosthetics with wax and things like that. So it mm-hmm. was all pretty outdated and there was no kind of contacts into the industry or anything. So, I mean, all it really did was give me the certificate I needed to go out and start kind of go, oh, I've done a makeup course. Can I come and work for you kind of thing? But um, it wasn't really the kind of springboard start that a lot of these big colleges will give people, which is incredible that they do. But that definitely wasn't my kind of introduction into the industry at all. Yeah. I mean, you'd figured out that you really enjoyed doing the whole makeup and the character side of things, but how did it kind of come about that you knew what direction you wanted to go with it? Oh, I, I didn't. I've never planned anything. <laughs> I, everyone always says to me, you know, what are your goals? What are your dreams? What do you want to do? Like, what's the what's the goal? And yeah. I've never really had that. I've just... I've kind of just enjoyed wherever I am at the time and just enjoyed doing whatever I was doing at the time. I still think about jobs where I worked in a little ice cream shop and I was just having a nice time when I was there and I didn't really think, oh, I need to be doing this or I need Mm. to be doing that. And so anything that's come my way, I've just kind of taken it and gone, oh, this is fun. Let's do this until it's not fun anymore kind of thing. Yeah. And so when I finished the course, I mean, I didn't know anyone. And so I just started looking for kind of makeup jobs online. And there were a couple of websites where some of the local film schools would put up that they were doing a short film. And so I'd apply to go and do their short films. And obviously it's all unpaid stuff, but every short film that I did eventually led on to something paid. And it was just kind of how I built up my contacts really. And sometimes on these forums, there might be, you know, a band who are doing a TV appearance and it's 25 pounds to do the band. And you just think, oh, that's fun. That'll be fun. It's like an hour's work for 25 pounds. You know, I'm laughing. And I just thought it was great. This is nearly 20 years ago now, but um, I don't know if it's still (laughs) like that anymore. (laughs) But uh, I would just kind of take anything that came my way. And it just happened that the short films and things started leading on to bigger stuff than the kind of music TV appearances did. So I did do some music videos and things when I started off, but I I don't think I quite fit into that world properly. Mm -hmm. I think I wasn't very, I wasn't probably cool enough or anything like that to kind of work in that world. And so it just seemed that the, the filmmaking world, I just seemed to sit a little uh, easier in. And so those contacts just kind of grew. And I mean, Again, I was living at home, so I could do it, which I know a lot of people can't. But I would just take anything I could. I barely made any money in the first couple of years because I was just doing free things here, free things there, just to meet people. But some of my biggest jobs that I've done as a designer have Mm. come from people that I did short films with 20 years ago. Right. You can kind of track it back. Yeah, exactly. Because some of those people who were producing that in their student world are now producing big Disney Lucasfilm productions and you know you turn up you do a good job and you're nice and they ask you back so uh, like our careers have grown together which is lovely yeah that's awesome yeah and it's just obviously you're so proud of your friends when you see that they're doing amazing stuff as well and then they're like hey come along and join and it's just great so I think all of that stuff at the beginning just really 
paid off in the long run. Obviously, it's not something that everyone can do if they need to pay bills and, you know, support a family and everything. But I was in a very kind of privileged position where I could do that. And that's really what helped guide where I am now, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's uh, what to take away from that is just definitely building those relationships. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it really is. I mean, I know social media is quite different now and people can get jobs because they put their work up all the time and you go, hey, they, you know, they do a good job and they do nice things. But I think actually meeting people in person and then realizing that you're a nice person to have around, that will get you back in the door quicker than anything else will, I think. Especially yeah. with like production, because ultimately they don't really know what goes on in the department, do they? They just need to know that everything's going to look nice at the end and that you're just a uh, pleasure pleasure to have around really <laughs> yeah that you're not fucking crazy and causing ridiculous drama that's not necessary <laughs> exactly exactly it's like oh she was great to work with let's yeah. get her back <laughs> yeah, i know and i think i've i've often had i think some of the compliments i've had from production are we didn't really hear from you we didn't really even kind of remember that you were there which is just nice for them because it means they're not having to deal with any of our issues yeah. and I think sometimes they like that they're like you just get on with it and we don't really hear from you it's like, oh, great. It, that's so funny I think I, I get a little bit of the same thing it's either I'm going to then I'm like I'm so sorry I'm bugging you and they're like what are you talking about yeah I never hear yeah. from you or yeah. they come to me and I'm like am I fired and it's just a joke that you know, yeah. just naturally comes out of my mouth and they're like oh my god you're the least of my problems exactly. Exactly, exactly. They've always got so much stuff, haven't they, going on? Goodness. They're like, that's, that's the complete opposite. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Very good. Yeah. Continue, continue. Um, <laughs> so because that course kind of, I guess, gave you such a minimal amount of what you needed. I mean, most courses do. I know that I came out of my training going, okay, I feel like I know some stuff, but actually when you start working in the industry, you're like, I know nothing. Oh, you Um, know nothing. (laughs) Nothing. So how did you kind of go about, I guess, learning and moving into the hair side of stuff as well and the wigs and all that type of stuff? Yeah. So I kind of fell into this low budget world of filmmaking for quite a while. Mm. And because obviously when you're doing little short films, it's just you. And so you are technically designing. And so I kind of fell right into designing kind of pretty much as soon as I left, if that's what you can call it on those smaller things. Yeah. Um, But because I didn't really have anyone to learn from, I just kind of had to work things out as I went along. Mm. And it gave me this kind of, kind of can do MacGyver attitude and I think when I uh, worked in New Zealand, everyone kind of said I had that Kiwi ingenuity where you just kind of you just kind of work everything out because you don't have as much as you know you don't have all the big makeup shops and things like that. You haven't got every product for everything, so you kind of look at the catering table and you're like, okay, how am I going to make sweat because I don't have yeah. it with me today? <laughs> you know. And um, so I think a lot of stuff I just had to kind of work out and I just had to make a lot of mistakes and work out what was going wrong. And I I mean, I don't know. I'm sure if I look back on some of it, I'd probably cringe and I try not to <laughs> look back on that kind of stuff too much. But I think with regards to really developing my skills, mm. I think, I mean, I'd been designing low budget films for about eight years and yeah. I'd got by. I'd got by. No one had pulled me up on anything that I didn't know. You know, I mean, I didn't know so much stuff I didn't know, but I, I hadn't got caught out yet, I suppose. Yeah. But I worked with a woman called Marcel Genevese. She's from Malta. She ran the crowd room on Apocalypto, actually, which um, still always blows my mind. Um, yeah. It's such an incredible movie. But she she kind of took me on and knew that I obviously wasn't from the big world of film and TV and things like that. And she knew that I had a, a bit of a, like I had the the drive mm. and she just was obviously aware of my skills. And she just said to me, you know, if you learn wigs, you'll never be out of work. And yeah. she's like, learn them properly. I was like, oh, okay, 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 I'm going to go do that. And so I contacted a wig company who helped me so much, a little wig company called Shepparton Wig Company. Hmm. And they, I kind of called them up and I said, oh, I'm looking to learn wigs. And they're like, sure, come along. And so I'd go in and they'd kind of go, okay, what can you do? And I'm like, oh, not much. And so they'd show me a couple of things and they'd just sit me in the corner and I'd just practice a bit of that. And then I'd, you know, come back next week and be like, oh, I've been practicing this. And they'll go, okay, well, great, do the next thing. And they really taught me 
kind of knotting and wig making right from the beginning. And if they were dressing wigs, they'd kind of show me what they were doing as well. And I think just putting that time in with them, I mean, I'm so grateful to them. They didn't have to do that at all. I was getting free training for next to nothing really. And the more I learned from them, every time I went on to a job, I suddenly realized how important it was that I understood these things. Because mm. if a wig wasn't sitting right, I could look at it and go, oh, that's because it's not knotted in the right direction. So it's never going to do that. So yeah. if you just pull out a few of these hairs and change that, then it will just sit nicely. And I remember on my first big job, like I'd never done anything, I'd never done a big film or anything before. And I somehow managed to get into a crowd room. Bearing in mind, I've been designing you know, inverted commas for eight years. I someone called me up and they said, We're looking for a trainee for Clash of the Titans. I was like, Yeah, I'm there, I'm there, let me in, kind of thing. <laughs> and so I went in as a trainee and some of their beards had holes in them. And I just kind of, you know, we're all trying to find things to do when there's 50 trainees in a crowd room. And yeah. I just said, you know, can I uh, repair some of your beards for you? You know, if, if you don't need me to do anything else. And I think that kind of blew them away because they were like, yeah, of course. So I just sat down and started repairing beards from them because I, for them, because I'd learned how to do it with um, Shepparton. And obviously then people walk past, they're like, oh, you can do that. Oh, that's, that's interesting to know. Okay. Well, I've got something coming up and, and everything. And that really got me noticed. And then you kind of become the person who does the knotting and then you become the wig person. And I think just really knowing how to do it all from scratch was such a, a big thing uh, and such a important kind of lesson in not only kind of making wigs, but dressing them as well. And actually on Clash of the Titans as well, this was, you know, I was actually ready to leave the industry. I was so sick of low budget stuff and people weren't paying me. And it was, you know, they were all being run by kind of gangsters and I just had enough of football hooligan movies and I was just ready to leave. And then when I got this job, this Clash of the Titans, I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. The sets were incredible. The hair and makeups were amazing. I'd seen wigs that had been dressed and I'd never seen anything like it before. And I just thought this is a whole new world. And Mark Pilcher, he was in the crowd room doing loads of wig dressing. And he was like, okay, so and I was kind of asking him questions about it. And he was, and he taught me how to manipulate waves and kind of dress things. And he just had a lot of time for us trainees. And I think if he saw that someone was keen, he was like, cool, let me show you. And he started showing me how to kind of set things and manipulate waves to make them do different things. And that really kind of kick-started my love for period hairdressing. Yeah, Just seeing what he could do with a curl once it had come out of a roller absolutely blew my mind. And so after that, I just spent all my time just sitting at home, just just dressing wigs and roller setting stuff and just practicing because I saw what could be done and I saw how much I didn't know. And I just thought I need to, I need to know this. I need to learn more. And so um, Mark Pilcher was a big kind of springboard for me learning and loving period hairdressing really. That's so awesome to hear. I just love hearing when someone, well, one, has the time because so very few of us kind of have time Mm -hmm. to actually be able to stop and show and explain and and teach, but that he was willing to do that as well. That's so awesome. That's the ideal kind of situation being in crowd, isn't it? Because sometimes you do have that time, but, you know, main team, when have you ever got time to do anything like that? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, is that just kind of your, I guess, philosophy on tackling, like learning things? Because it sounds like you were very thorough and kind of held yourself accountable to kind of, you know, practice and go over it and over it and over it and do that at home and just kind of continue your own education with it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, with everything that I've tried to do, I've kind of just had to become obsessed with it. When I started doing special effects stuff, I started in a workshop because I was like, right, I want to know how everything's made. Right. And so you learn how everything's made from the, the ground up and then you can see if things aren't right. And, you know, really seeing everything through properly, it gives you such a kind of better understanding of it all. But yeah, especially with wigs, it frustrated me that I couldn't do what he could do. And it obviously that's ridiculous because he'd been doing it for such a long time and I just started. <laughs> but the, no one was going to sit down and teach me that every day. And that was something that you had to practice. It wasn't something like, oh, okay, here's how I like to do a base. And then someone goes, okay, great. And they just do it the same. It's not the same as, you know, here's how you roll a set and dress out 
a wick that it just takes practice and practice and practice. And I thought I have to do that. I have to keep doing it. And so, you know, whether it was on the dolly heads or whatever, it was just doing it over and over again and watching old videos. You know, I love like the old Pathé videos, the Mm. hairdressing videos, and you watch the way that they brush out the hair and you watch the way that they there's my, one of my favorite videos is this one where they make a little hair switch or something, but the way he cuts her hair off, it's just all tease cut. And that's what I do on all of my wigs because obviously when wigs are all knotted, they're knotted with all the hair is the same length, but nobody's head of hair is like that. So mm. tease cutting all the hair gives you all those lovely flyaways, which makes it look real. And just watching that that was how they were doing things in the 50s and doing that nowadays is what obviously helps you get those lovely period, soft, fluffy edges, you know. And I think if you don't get obsessed and start looking at stuff like that, you don't find those things out because you just, if you're looking at modern techniques all the time, Mm. then, you know, a period hairstyle won't work with a modern haircut because it was cut so differently. And I think if you don't spend the time really looking into things, then you don't discover those things. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's good advice also to pass on, but you kind of just do hope that people naturally will have that inquisitive mind to kind of Mm. keep looking and keep searching and keep, I mean, there's nothing more beneficial, I think, than just the repetitive nature of Mm -hmm. something, just doing it again and again and building a muscle memory and just, you know, and all those different roller sets and stuff that you're doing is just trying it, but then also seeing what that end result is afterwards, brushing it out differently, you know, all that type of stuff to just be like, I'm going to try it this way and see what happens. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why kind of crowd rooms and theatre are very good as well. Mm. Like doing stuff in theatre, you know, obviously doing something over and over and over again. And you just think, well, if I do it slightly more like this, what happens? But that curiosity is what I think really helps you build your skill set. And I I think that's what I admire most in trainees like I've had trainees come to me and they're like oh can we practice this today and so you do and then the next time you see them you see that they've done it three times at home since then and you just think you're going to get good because you're willing to put the time in and so I think people who are willing to do that in their own time shows how much they want to like learn whereas sometimes you get people and you're like oh I'll learn it when I'm on the job kind of thing and you think well you won't get those jobs if you don't have the skills so you're going to have to put something in outside if you can, in order to get the the job that you want. Yeah, that's just how I am anyway. I, I like to just really get into something and just go right next. That was the other thing that made that I wanted to be able to do as a designer because mm. I did work with some people who maybe couldn't do hair or couldn't do whatever. And I know that a lot of people have their kind of set skills in whatever area, but I realized that I wanted to anyone to be able to come to me and go, how do I do this? And I could show them. Yeah. And I thought if I can't do that and I can't support my team, I will feel like I'm not good enough to be there. So I have to have worked this stuff out so I can help help the team. That's an awesome way to look at it. I like that. I think it's also important maybe a little more so in your realm because you guys do have trainees and juniors. Yeah. Whereas we don't have that over here which is oh really not in the states no um yeah there is no system it's (laughs) i think it's horribly flawed like you have your thirds and fourths and all that type of stuff but it's not there is no trainee junior system where people work their way up oh interesting you can if you're on something big enough you can ask to hire a PA and it can be, you can say it's like a hair PA or a makeup PA. Um, They wouldn't be able to touch anybody at any point, like actually do hair or makeup. And then also those days that they do as a PA wouldn't go towards them getting into the union or anything like that. So it's, um, yeah, it's kind of tricky. system. Yeah. I mean, the trainees and and juniors are so important in our world. And I mean, on some of the big stuff, people won't let trainees do anything anyway, but I always try and, you know, give them a couple of simple casts or get them to jump on and help out with us. Cause I think that's just how they, how they learn and how they get better. And also how you can see what they can do as well. Um, And so it's such a good kind of training ground for them. Um, Unfortunately, people 
do end up using their trainees for doing all the paperwork because we don't have coordinators, which is something we're really trying to push for because there's so much paperwork now, which is just something that no one really thinks of when they think about the hair and makeup industry. Yeah. But we're so overloaded with paperwork and accounts and things like that, that a lot of people will use their trainees to do that and they won't get to do any actual kind of learning, which I think is a real shame. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a double edged situation, really, because I mean it's good for them to learn that stuff because they mm. will probably need to know it at some point. But yeah. at the same time, yeah, if there's no room for you know anything else to be learned or growing, or then mm. it's it's tricky. But yeah, absolutely, yeah, the admin side of things, I'm just like, are you, are you? and I think like it's just like the, nobody really thinks about. It's just like, yeah, you're doing hair and makeup all day, and it's just like, yeah, and managing people and yeah. doing admin and dealing yeah. with yeah. <laughs> production people, and this and that. And <laughs> yeah, the I mean, the managing people bit is something that I found the hardest actually. Mm. But I I find the hair and makeup stuff very easy, and I can often you know deal with the producers and directors. I kind of know what they want. But, you know, normally with the cast as well, but it's ensuring that everyone on your team is happy, Mm. as happy as you can get them to be anyway, and ensure that everybody is doing things that are fulfilling them and also doing things that, you know, kind of push them, but they're not putting anyone in situations they feel uncomfortable in. And then if there's clashes on the team, like having to deal with all that stuff as well. And, you know, it's almost a, it's like a HR job that, you end up doing as well, but all all the same time trying to run the actual show. So it yeah. is such it's something that I think people don't realise is such a big part of being a head of department, I suppose. Oh yeah. I mean it's like it's something people normally need a degree or something in. It's yeah. like dealing with people. So yeah. <laughs> and we just kind of fumble our way through it and yeah. hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, people, I mean, we're not trained for it, are we? We don't get given, we're putting these positions because we have a, you know, strong body of work and good at what we do or whatever. And, but then no one puts us on a managerial course and says, mm-hmm. okay, so if someone has a problem with this, this is the most effective way of dealing with it, you know. And even if you do know those things, trying to apply those techniques when you're, you know, overworked and tired and under pressure, it's, it's so difficult. So, no one quite trains you for that side of things. I think there is a company who are offering kind of leadership and managerial courses for heads of department so That's that cool. if people do feel like they need to learn how to be more of a manager, then they can go and do that. But it's just a day or like half a day or something like that, whereas it's something you just really have to develop over time. And yeah, it's a it's a tricky thing sometimes managing your way through all of that stuff um, on yeah. top of all the other stuff that everyone knows is our job (laughs) yeah on top of I mean and because as you were saying it's just like people are doing crazy hours they're tired Mm -hmm. they're you know depending on the job it must be maybe incredibly challenging or stressful and then we are a bunch of creatives so Uh, it's just like there's that on top of it so it's just yeah it's very tricky I'm always Mm -hmm. in one hand I I just think it it should be you know you should be able to be able to keep your team happy and not yeah. cause too much drama or whatever. But then on the other hand, when you hear about, I guess, bosses and stuff that aren't so great or horrible or for whatever you're hearing or whatever the reason, but you kind of, half of me is just like, well, there's just no need for that. But then on the other side of it, it's just like, oh, Maybe mm. they're just not naturally built for it. You know, mm. maybe if they just did have some training, they would be able to handle yeah. it a little bit better and understand what's going wrong because maybe they just are really trying, but it's all just, yeah. you know, kicking back in their face and they don't know why because yeah. they're an artist. <laughs> I'm like, I can't deal with people. <laughs> exactly, exactly, because we all just want to create really, don't we? We just yeah. <laughs> need to wipe good coffee and create things. And yeah. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of these people who do end up getting in trouble, they're such incredibly talented people Mm. um, and they just end up getting broken because they aren't taught how to manage and then they kind of get knocked back constantly and it's it's actually quite sad to see sometimes, I think. Yeah. But then there are people who are just assholes. Awful. Awful. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> We're not forgiving that. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> and Pippa, so if you look back on your resume so far, mm. what would you say are your top favorite projects that you've worked on and why? Okay. Um, in order of cr- chronologically as well, I'm going to do this. Okay. <laughs> um, so the first one, Clash of the Titans, um, yeah. for reasons that I've kind of already gone into. But mm-hmm. um, as I said, I nearly left the industry. I was ready to kind of pack it all in. I just had enough. And then it was the first time that I really saw um, this whole other side. And I remember standing there and just looking at some of the sets. And there was, you know, there were rivers running through the center of the set in a studio. And I just thought, this is wild. <laughs> I've yeah. never seen anything like it. Okay. And obviously meeting um, Mark and learning about um, just the kind of basics of manipulating hair and what could be done. And I remember um, there were all these kind of, it was, oh, what was Clash of the Titans? It kind of Roman, wasn't it? Mm. And it was, or Greek. Was it Greek? I have no idea. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, there were all of these beautiful hairstyles and there was this kind of group of sex workers, I suppose, and they were all kind of stained with like oranges and yellows and things like that. And he said, yeah, I want them all to look like they've been stained with piss. <laughs> and I thought, this is brilliant. I've never even thought of like having a little story behind something, you know. Yeah. And it was really where I met all my kind of future contacts. So after that job, I then started working as a trainee for people. So even though I'd been doing my own thing for a while, mm. that was when I really just went right I need to go back and start again and learn how to do this properly which leads me on to my next one because after that job I met a lady called Kate Benton Mm -hmm. who I always say I always when I grow up I want to be like Kate because she she just gives you confidence you know she makes you feel like you can do anything and even as a kind of trainee or an assistant for her you know a director would walk in and kind of go right I think we should do this and we should do that you know, how would you do that? And she'd have a little thing and she'd be like, Pip, what do you think? And I think, oh my God, you're asking me in front of a grown up, you know, and she'd take on your ideas and then you'd kind of work together and get it done. And um, I did a sketch show with her, a Mitchell and Webb sketch show. And Mm. we had stuff in front of a live studio audience. And because it was a sketch show, it was like, okay, so for this scene, they are kind of, they're vampires, your classic kind of Nosferatu vampires with, you know, these wigs and white hair and this, that, the other, and they're covered in blood. And then because it's a live studio audience, you've got seven minutes to get them into um, kind of middle-aged women looks, you know. <laughs> and it was, I was like, it, the speed that we had to do things was absolutely mind-blowing. You know, we were like taking off false nails and everything, everyone just working on everybody. Mm. And there was no money. And so Kate just had a stock of wigs and we'd be like will this one work work maybe it'll work let's shove that on and pleat this here and cut that up there and everything just you just had to make things work and nothing had to be perfect but it kind of taught me uh, what you can get away with whereas I'd always focused on getting everything so perfect and she'd go oh and I'd say well this bit isn't right here she's like just push the hair over it if you think yeah, of course. Smush it, smush it. Yeah, smush it. Push the hair over it. And I'm like, oh, I can see this. She's like, colour it in. Just colour it dark. It's fine. You won't see it. And I just thought, oh, my God, this is brilliant. So she really taught me how to, like, the speed of that show and everything, it really taught me how to let some things go and how to hide things and just make stuff work rather than, like, obsessively get everything perfect. And obviously mm. it's good to know how to do both. But, you know, when you've got a whole kind of floor waiting for you to do something sometimes you don't have time to go off and make it perfect and you do just have to go just put some hair over it and be done with it so that was that was a great one for me and then the third one it's a little bbc kind of cop show that probably nobody watched um and it was called cuffs Mm -hmm. and it was set down in brighton which is this little seaside town but it's just it was so full of like just vibrant characters and things like that and you know, we were down there for the summer. The cast were lovely. But the thing the thing that I loved the most about it was that we were creating characters, but we were creating real people. Mm. Obviously, we were getting these kind of immaculate actors coming in, and then we had to make them look like they'd been working the streets for 12 years or that they were addicted to heroin or that they worked in a tattoo studio and were covered from the neck down in kind of cute little cartoon tattoos. And so we really got to just try and observe real life Mm. and try and not over make anybody up like we didn't want anyone to look like they'd been through hair and makeup of course and so we were just trying all these really like little subtle things 
that just made someone look like they had a tougher paper round than the rest of us, you know? Yeah. And or just knowing when to not do something. Like, exactly. no, don't put any base on them. Exactly. Don't, yeah. <laughs> just don't conceal under the eyes. Yeah, don't yeah. do that. And, and sometimes it's hard for people to, because people sit down in the chair and they go, right, foundation, concealer, blusher, mm-hmm. eyes. And actually it's like, no, they don't need anything. Maybe they put some eyeliner on three days ago and it's still a bit in their bottom lashes. Maybe do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of it. And that's a big thing to kind of learn to be okay with. But mm. um yeah, that that I really enjoyed just creating those real life looks, but really subtle things. Like we want we gave one boy acne scarring and it was so subtle and just no one even noticed, but it was what it needed in order to just give him that different bit of a history, you know. But we had no money mm. and um I think at this time I done a job where I got to keep one wig and that wig got used on about five different people (laughs) it was on some kind of young traveler boy it was on this kind of posh older woman it was it was on everyone because it was the only wig that I had and it was where we kind of learned to like draw up and print our own tattoos as well because we didn't have money to to buy custom made tattoos and yeah. so we had the whole team sitting on set drawing all these tattoos out and um yeah just learned how to kind of laser print them and make them work and everything and so and we were sculpting our own prosthetics and things like that as well because we didn't have money to buy anything like that and so everyone got to learn how to make prosthetics apply prosthetics um draw tattoos print tattoos apply the tattoos and you know all of that stuff and having to kind of knot little bits of facial ourselves because we just didn't have the money and so it was like for me it was still one of my favorite jobs even though no one's ever heard of it it's not a big thing but it was I think just creating all those real people and doing it invisibly Mm. is that's one of my favorite things to do and so that was a that was one I loved. And then just being able to, I mean, having that challenge of not having the budget and actually mm. getting everybody to do everything, yeah. production must have loved you. Oh, they did. <laughs> <laughs> so it's they just did. like, wow, what she's pumping out with what we've given her, this is incredible. <laughs> no, luckily, again, it was one of my friends. It was someone I'd met, you know, years ago. And so they, like, I knew that they weren't talking me over basically I knew that they weren't kind of going oh we've only got 10 pounds when Mm. actually they had 100 like I knew that they had what they said they had yeah and you know so I I just thought you know what let's do it then it will be fun it will be a you know it will be a good little fun project for everyone everyone get to practice lots and learn lots and let's just all have a nice time down in a seaside town during the summer that's awesome you kind of hope that they they walk away in those instances and go imagine what she could do with money yeah yeah absolutely instead of going well if she can do that with nothing then the next thing i'll give her nothing and she can do (laughs) no well i mean luckily because it was one of my friends i mean she still goes on about it to this day she's like awesome i remember when you would be doing this and you'd be pulling this out of the gutter and be like i've just found this let's see if that works you know (laughs) and so I think people do remember it but I think they only really appreciate it when they work with someone who isn't willing to kind of help them out if they need it yeah yeah but I think back then I was just so eager to please that I was like sure whatever you need I'll stay up all night and just get it done whereas I think as I get a bit more comfortable I am a bit better at pushing back and going actually you know boundaries we need the next day to do that you know (laughs) and sometimes you know you just have to make it work you know I've literally had people go right we're at a point now where we need to get this finished Mm. and we need you to do whatever it is that you need to do and you just let us know what you need to achieve it yeah and so now I've got better at kind of going okay fine we'll stay late but we need a hotel this side or we need something you know we need something so that it's not no one's putting himself in a dangerous situation yeah you know or we need yeah, whatever it is that we need. So I've got better at asking for things. Whereas before I would literally just stay up all night and <laughs> just be like, don't worry, I'll just knock this beard myself all night and not sleep at all. <laughs> yeah. I'm you glad, you've, I'm I'm glad like, you've got those boundaries now. It yes. sounds very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. That's awesome. <laughs> so now that you're doing more designing and co-designing and stuff, when you're putting a team together, what what are you looking for? There's a few different things. There's a few different things that I look for. I've kind of always said that if somebody comes to me with a good attitude, then I can teach them anything. I can teach them the skills, but I can't teach them how to be a nice person. Yeah. So like if people have got a willingness to learn, then, you know, one of um, my strongest ever team members 
was someone who came to me with basically no experience whatsoever. She'd done kind of three weeks at a makeup school and, and that was it. But she was eager to learn. She was one of those people where you kind of go, oh, here's how you put in a hot roller. And then, you know, the next time you turn around, she's done 20 wigs or something in her own time because she just wanted to get better. And she is, you know, to this day, still one of the most talented people I know because she wanted to do so much. And so we taught her how to sculpt prosthetics and apply them and, you know, do whatever. And, you know, she's amazing now because she had that attitude and was just willing to do it. So she kind of worked her way up quite quickly within the team because she deserved it, you know, because she'd worked so hard for it. So if people, yeah, if people are willing, then I will kind of teach them everything that I can because I've, you know, done my time in prosthetic workshops and things. So I can teach people how to make stuff and, because I've done the time at the wigs, I can do that. And, you know, so I'm happy to teach people those skills if they're willing to learn. Having said that, there are some skills that you just need the experience for. Yeah. And so that is where it changes. So kind of strong barbers, Afro hairstylists and hairdressers, that's not something that you just show someone how to do it once. Like they need that history of the experience behind them mm. in order to know. I need them to know more than me you know? And so if someone comes in with those kind of strong skills, then they immediately just slot into the team because there's, you know, designers will always have their weak spots. They'll always have things that they're not amazing at. And so those, you want to bring those people in who will fill those gaps and be better than you at all of those things, because obviously the better your team are, the better everybody looks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and especially having kind of strong Afro barbers and Afro hairstylists on the team, obviously, because we don't want anyone to come on, you know, any cast to come into the department and not feel like somebody can look after their hair properly. You know, that's obviously such a big thing that we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and looked after and represented in the team as well. Um, and that's why I always try and make sure that we've got diverse range of backgrounds and experiences on the team as well. I had an uh, actor come in recently and he was kind of really quiet, mm. young black actor. And he came in and he, yeah, he was quite quiet for a little bit. And I was like, you're okay. And he said, yeah, honestly, it's just weird to come in and see people that look like me. He said, it's just not something that I'm used to. And he said, I'm just a little bit emotional. And I was like, wow, okay. I mean, that's kind of heartbreaking to see, but also I'm glad that you feel, yeah, you know, comfortable in this room right now. Yeah. Um, and it was just such a kind of wake up and just go, wow, this, you know, obviously needs to change, you know, in all the makeup departments, not just mine. So the other thing that I'm trying to do within my department is try and, you know, obviously it's going to take a while before there are as many black and brown designers as there are white designers. Mm. But what I'm trying to create a kind of safe space where we can elevate people without putting them in positions where they're going to get stressed and overwhelmed and just go this isn't for me and so I always try and use one of my key positions for like an assistant designer position or a co-designer position where it just gives someone a voice at the table which is obviously important for them and for like the actors who are having the fittings you know I want to give someone a voice so they can be heard so their opinions can be heard but also be put in a position where they don't have all the pressure that comes with running a department. So I've got a a wonderful girl at the moment called Tamara who's been doing quite a few jobs with me and she comes into meetings and she's always there with the fittings. Um, She doesn't have all the stress that you get from the grown-ups as such, Mm. but she gives her opinions and we work things through together and she's learning how to run a department without all that weight being on her shoulders. And I'm hoping that that is also going to give her the credits that she needs for when she does want to change over to designing but it just means that she's in a kind of a nurtured safe position where she can learn the ins and outs of it so that when she does make that step across then she's got that knowledge and that experience and is confident speaking up in meetings and in fittings and things like that and I think that the more people that can you know put their egos aside and let someone step in and do that with them then the quicker we can balance everything out. Yeah, makes absolutely. No, it totally makes sense. And it's just instead of her feeling thrust into something all of a sudden yeah. that she's just like, I feel like I'm going to sink, you're just yeah. totally giving her some solid ground to know what she's doing, what she's talking about. She will be able to walk into a room and understand the conversations that need to happen because she's had that guidance. But also with you being a designer department head and having that person next to you I mean 
I love to tell my team what is going on from start to finish as well. Like I'm yep. always, I'm the communicator. I want the more information they have, yep. I feel they the more they can help me. <laughs> Absolutely. And actually she is such a huge help. And there's times when, you know, cause if I, if I came up with everything myself, everything would look the same. Mm. And actually she's so good at just going, you know, those guys all look the same or, you know, or how about you try that or how about you try this and actually having that person next to you, you know, and she's always spot on with everything that she, she says, you know, and we see very similar kind of, you know, we both like the same things and dislike the same things. So mm. it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's like having a kind of buddy there who just kind of goes, you know, you're doing great or, you know, let's try this instead. And and it does take a bit of that pressure off you as well. So I think it's actually just an incredibly useful position to have. Yeah. But I have, I've done it wrong before. You know, I brought someone in as a co-designer before mm. and I forgot that they weren't used to the pace of things that I was. And so I just tried to kind of, not split everything up, but have them kind of running along the same speed as me. And we were doing everything together. And very quickly, they just said, this is actually just too much for me. And I was like, okay, well, I'll pull all the workload back and I'll, you know, try and give you less. And, but at that, that point she'd already gone, actually, I, you know, this isn't for me, you know, and then you lose them. And this person is actually wanting to do that again at some point. But I think if I did that again with them, I would just have to do more what I've done recently and just really just kind of give them much kind of smaller amounts of stuff to do because it's weird when you run a department you just get used to all of the questions and everything being on you constantly and it kind of becomes second nature but if you're not used to that then it can seem a lot so it's just trying to remember that not everybody um can take the same load as you because you've obviously got used to it um whereas they won't have yet so Again, it's managing, isn't it? Managerial stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it's I, I think it's just the experience of it as well. It's just like I was I had somebody asking me the other day, they're just like, I think I'm ready to move over and to do more head of department stuff. But she was feeling nervous about like, so you know, how do the conversations work between you and the in production and you and the director and you and, and I was just like I don't know if that's something that is necessarily like can be put down on paper or taught because every job is different. Every job, yeah. Everyone communicates differently. The needs of what you're needing to put together are different. So you kind of each job you get as much information as you can and you lay it out in a way that's going to work for that yeah. job. And I, I kind of said to her, I was just like, have you not, been in a position where you've been able to be included in some of these like or listen in on some of these conversations and unfortunately she hadn't and it's those times of when there's like a production meeting and it's just like I would like to bring my key like my assistant yeah. department head into the production meeting please yeah. because once again it's just like you know the more information everybody has the you know, I can't remember everything. No, I, if absolutely. I, you know, you want backup. Um, yeah. But just being able to, yeah, get them in the room into those situations and, yeah, yeah as you say. And it's great having them there because she sits there writing everything down and then later on when I'm like, who said that about what? Yeah. She's like, oh, he said, he said, okay, okay, brilliant. But no, it's great. It's, uh, yeah, it's great. But um, also I find that everything's different. You know, they'll say, well, how do you normally do that? And then you do that. And then on this job, it's totally different. And yeah. people say, well, what about the, um, you know, setting up the account system on this? And you think, honestly, every job I do, I go into the accounts department. And I'm like, right, how do you like it done? Yeah. Because we all like it done differently. And it's like you have to learn a whole new system. And so people panic because they don't know how to do it. And you're like, nobody does when they start a new one because everyone's got different systems. So yeah. It's, you've just got to approach everything with bent knees and be very fluid with it all, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when you are designing and coming up with ideas and prepping and looking at your character development and all that kind of stuff, what are some of your favorite research sources? Like where do you pull your research and inspiration from? Yeah, I mean, it depends what it is. Obviously, if it's something period, then, you know, you can look at every image under the sun on the internet, but everyone's seen the same images and, and often you never see the back. So and yeah. I... God damn I, it. You know, <laughs> and, you know, all these beautiful paintings and you're like, why did no one paint the back? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I actually, I like going to galleries. I uh, went to... Um, 
an exhibition recently and you know there's all these like beautiful sculptures and you get to walk around them you get to see the back and you get to Mm. see like the full silhouettes and you get to see the textures that you don't often see in the paintings so I do like to kind of do the galleries and and you know all the paintings and sculptures and all of that kind of stuff and old movies I also sometimes like to see how you know, I've got a couple of books and it's all the kind of silent screen stuff and it's all the images from that. But you go, okay, that's interesting how they interpreted the 18th century. Yeah. You know, it just gives you a different way of looking at it rather than looking at how everyone interprets it now or mm. how we interpret those images just for a different idea. And you go, okay, well, how did the greats of the 40s, you know, come up with those kind of things? And so I like looking at the old, the old stuff. You know, I would be lying if I said that I didn't use social media Mm. and Pinterest and things like that because I think there's so much good stuff out there I think it would be silly not to Um, I have loads of books I love all my books because there's a lot of obviously images in books that you don't find on the internet yeah I'm a book hoarder lots of books on kind of hats books and you know paintings of high society and things Mm. like that so things that you wouldn't think are hair and makeup reference books but you just happen to have all these beautiful images so yeah, I've got. I, I go around the shops and just look at, you know, uh, how life was for the Victorians, and often there's a ton of images in there, you know, that you don't find anywhere else. Yeah. But um, again, like I said, you know, learning to tease cut hair from the old Pathé videos and things like that. So I try and just use as big a kind of, you know, as much varied stuff as I can. But it depends what it's for. You know, at the moment I'm on something that's modern day, yeah. and the most important thing was that it looked real. And yeah. so we were we were going, right, let's find real people. You know, we'd have to find people who work on the trains and people who work in security jobs. And you really just go, they just have their hair in a ponytail. And that lady has some lipstick on and nothing else. And that's what we're going to do. And yeah. again, it comes back to that whole thing of just do less, you know. And because my guys have done lots of period stuff with me, they're doing like intricate kind of updos. And I'm like, just put it in a ponytail. In fact, in fact, tell them to put it in a ponytail themselves mm. and then don't touch it. Because actually that's how it looks <laughs> the best, <Yeah. laughs> you know. And so just real, just looking at real life stuff. And just really trying to replicate that as close as possible for, you know, modern day things. Yeah. Um, and then I've, you know, done things before where everything's got to be a little bit out of this world. And then I will look at more kind of, oh, actually, one of my favorite ones is this website called ArtStation. Mm-hmm. And it's basically all these very clever kind of like graphic designers who will do this kind of like fan art or, you know, a lot of it looks like computer games or, and it's just these still images, but it's just things that they've created. And obviously they can do anything because they're, you know, computer whizzes. But <laughs> that's actually, so for some of the more fantasy stuff that I've done, I've actually looked on there because it's it's kind of fantasy gaming kind of world stuff that might not be something that you normally look at but actually the things that they come up with are fantastic and some of the images they create such a a vibe and such a tone that if you put those all over your mood board someone immediately knows where they are right and very character driven for what yes. the, yeah it's just all about these characters whether it's trolls or whether it's elves or whatever it is it just really transports you into a different world and so i think for willow most of my mood boards were all these kind of, they look like they've been pulled out of video games or, you know, little fantasy things. And it just totally transported you somewhere else. And it wasn't the kind of stuff that you would normally look for. So that yeah. was something that I really um, enjoyed looking at. Yeah. I am, um, as controversial as it is, I am absolutely fascinated with the AI stuff that's Me been coming out. <laughs> and I feel like the devil saying it out loud. No. But- I'm completely with you. It just is incredibly inspirational. Like you just look at it and you're like, oh, my God. Okay. You're just looking at it going, how can at some point I need to get on a job where I can just pull that element out of there and that element out of there and I want to mush it together and create my own thing. But it just really gets your brain going. Well, they're not confined by 
any restraints of thinking they might do too much or thinking it might not Mm. be enough or Mm. they don't have those kind of worries in their head that someone might not like what I'm doing. So if you say create a kind of devil woman with frog feet and, uh, you know, fairy (laughs) wings, the stuff it will come up with, you'll just think Mm. that's incredible because they're not, it's not being held back by anything. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a good, it's a good starting point for us to just see things that, because I, I feel like I'm good at replicating things. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm good at creating stuff that's never been seen before. And I mean, so that I, is, that's very difficult, though. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Come on. But so if I see period <laughs> hairstyles or like makeups that I like, I can replicate them or like special effects things, I can replicate them. Mm. But I think that's where AI might be helpful because then they come up with something new and you go, great, let's do that. Like, let's pull that and recreate that kind of thing. And then technically you can kind of, you know, do what you do with it. But it's, yeah, it's that coming up with the things that no one's done before. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. I always feel like I'm, I'm saying, it's just like, oh, I shouldn't say that out loud, but. No, you can say it. <laughs> Some of it is just so beautiful or so, yeah. it's just fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously it's just got to be used wisely. If it starts putting people out of work, that's different. But if it's helping us to do more interesting things, I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah. So where you are now and having come up through the industry like you did, what advice would you give someone looking to get into this work or if they're at the beginning, if they're in a trainee position? I think just mainly just be keen. Like yeah. I think people who come onto the team where like nothing is too big a problem, those are the people that I want to keep around when you're like, oh, I'm sorry, this is a rubbish job. Do you mind? They're like, no, sure, I'll do that. And you think, mm. great, I want you around all of the time. Mm. So I think once you've got, once you've kind of got onto a team or you're meeting someone, if you're just keen and nothing is too big a deal, then people will just want you around, you know, if you can make their life easier. Even if it's things like making your CV really easy to read, you know, that's helpful for me because if I get big complicated CVs, I immediately just go, oh my God, I don't have time, you know, if you're, if it's a really busy day. But if someone just gives you this really simple, easy to read, here's my skills, here's what I've done, thank you very much. I just think that is very effective and I feel like you'll be efficient on the team. (laughs) Well, I mean, that is across the board. It's just like everything should be efficient and effective. and (laughs) exactly. But, yeah, so I think also just find, as I said before, designers have always got a weak point and they'll always need someone skilled to fill that gap. Mm -hmm. So if you find a skill and learn it well and you can master it, then people will need you. And that goes back to that bit of advice that I was given when she just said, learn wigs and you will never be out Mm, of the job. And that really is what's kind of kept me in the job. In fact, when I went to New Zealand, um, I was just traveling around and then, you know, someone's like, there's a wig maker in the country, don't let them leave. And, you know, and then suddenly I was working out there because they needed someone who could not. And, And so that's what kind of kept me over there for a couple of years. So there's a lot of jack of all trades out there, but if you have something which you are good at and people need it, then you've got a job. So try and find that thing that is going to get you noticed and, and learn to do it well. That's awesome. I would like to know, what is a film that you remember watching and just being blown away by the hair and or makeup? Um, Akira Knightley's hair looks in The Duchess. I just thought the silhouettes... And the textures were stunning. Mm. I think she was looked after by a lady called Lou Shepard, who's kind of a, a, a goddess with hair. A period and hair, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I just remember watching it and they weren't overcomplicated. They were just, they were simple and beautiful and striking. And I always think whenever I'm trying to do stuff, I think what's the absolute bare minimum I can do to get the maximum effect yeah. and I think that's what she did there was nothing that was too overcomplicated, but they were strong silhouettes you know gorgeous textures and it just worked it's smart too I mean oh. it, recreating these things for continuity yep. come on oh. <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> but actually um apocalypto mm-hmm was one of those things and you just look at it and you go, I mean, I was talking to the lady who ran the crowd and she said there were 250 makeup artists in the crowd room and they would all have a little light above their station. So when they'd finished, they'd press this thing and a light would come on and then they'd get the next person sent down. But some of them were in the chair for four hours because they had the ear stretches and all of that kind of stuff, um, all the stretched ears. And some of them would just go home and sleep in it, you know, because for ease. But they 
you just you go that's not been replicated they're all there and they all went through hair and makeup and mm. nothing looks fake nothing looks like makeup everything looks real and i just think it I still watch it now and I just think they did all of that. They did all of it. <laughs> you know. I'm going to have to revisit, I think. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's it's a pretty tough watch kind of yeah. emotionally. Yeah. Um, but from a kind of hair and makeup point of view, you just go, they they have stretched ears, they have scarification, they have this, they have that. And it just all looks, oh, you forget that it's makeup. Wow. They just look fantastic. That's cool. Mm-hmm. And what one tool or product will you never want to be without? Can I do one for hair and one for makeup? Of course you can. (laughs) Makeup wise, my Mac Pro palette. Okay. They're these kind of wax based formulas that I use for everything, whether it's foundation, concealer, blush, injuries. Like if I, I've basically decanted my big one down into like a little palette, which is the most satisfying thing that I have in my kit. Um, (laughs) I just have a tiny bit of every color and just having that like you anyone could throw anything at you or anything oh, i just i've got my i've got my mac pro palette i'm fine um and so that makeup wise if i've got that then i know that i can kind of get out of like any any situation and um hair wise it's actually um something that i've only started using recently which has been oh it's been such a huge help mm. It's this it's this little wand that a friend of mine called Joseph Cognac created. And it's basically a little flocked wand. So if you imagine the end of a tail comb, but it's got flocking round it. Mm. And you use it to kind of tidy up hairstyles. You can use it for various different things. But I just did like a Tudor show and there were lots mm. of plaits and twists and things like that. And obviously things rubbing up against collars, everything would just pull out towards the end and then you'd have to redress the whole thing. But I started using this little wand and if the hair had come out of the twist, mm. you would just catch the hair up with this little flocked wand and just push it back through the twist. And it was almost like you were sewing the hair back into it. Because obviously the flocking um, just picked up the hair and just pushed it back through. So it wasn't like you were trying to feed it through. It just, you could just retwist everything back in. It was so simple and just having it on set to, and it's good for things like French plaits, you know, if you, all the hairs are coming out and you just smooth it down with this little wand and then push it through the plait, it just pulls all the hair back through. That's something that if I've got that in my bag, I can just tidy up, tidy up anything. But I've seen him use it for, you know, if someone's hair's getting in their face, mm. he'll use it and just kind of thread it through the hair a couple of times and just catch a couple of little hairs and it will just hold everything place in place even if the hair's down. So that's been, yeah, that's been so super helpful, especially for period hairstyles. That's interesting. So what is it called? It's called the K wand. So the letter K. Yeah, I think it's K. Yeah, I call it the K one. I don't know if it's J K one. His name is Joseph Cognac, but they sell him in the makeup shops over here. Um, I don't know if they do in the states, but you just get a little pack of four of these little ones, and they oh, they've just been an absolute lifesaver. That's awesome. I will find it online and I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone that wants to check them out because that sounds fascinating. Yeah, it's awesome. And one person you'd like to hear on the podcast? Oh, um. So I was think someone who I think would be fascinating to listen to is Jenny Shercor. Have you had her on? Have you had her on? I have not had her on, and I oh. was um, just having dinner with um, my agent the other day, and we were going through like who who have I had? Who do I need to get on? And oh. she was just like, "What about Jenny?" And I was just like, "I'm scared." Yes, I know. I know. She's she just so been, you know. She's done she's it all. So that woman, calm, and she has this incredibly calm demeanor. You know, whenever she's around, she just almost kind of floats into a room and um, she never seems flustered or anything. And I think I've had a, only had a couple of conversations with her, but you kind of just think, I don't even know how to speak around you. You know, she's got <laughs> such a huge, varied career, varied career. And yeah. um, so many actors that I've worked with, you know, you kind of say, how was Jenny? And they just go, wow. I mean, she, you know, the way she sits down and goes through everything with them and just creates all these things and... I've heard stories of her just sitting there with the actor in front of them, you know, just like sketching something out or something. And you just think, oh gosh, I bet your brain is such a fascinating place. Um, But she just does such, I've seen her do such kind of interesting, different out there looks without anything seeming theatrical, which I think is such a skill to do. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. 
there you go. You've you've <laughs> you've given me the kick <laughs> up luck. the butt that I need. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. That's awesome. And before we wrap, how would yeah. you like to do a quick fire round of questions in thirty seconds? Sure. <laughs> okay. So ready? Yeah. What would you rather work in, heat or cold? Cold. Rain or wind? Wind. Location or stage? Location. Days, splits or nights? Splits. <laughs> Do you agree? Fake it till you make it? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Have you ever been fired? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, not yet. I like that. <laughs> I'm very confident if I just went, no. <laughs> Never. I have this underlying thing that every job, it's just like, it, oh, this I could get time. fired at any moment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I oh. love it. Well, that was fun. And thank you for your time. This has been so awesome chatting with you finally, Kippa. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so lovely to chat to you. Thanks for having me. Of course. <laughs> Okay, Last Looks crew, thanks for listening. And remember, if you love it, share it. A quick scroll down and you'll find our show notes. Or maybe you'd like to give your support and leave a five-star review. Go on, I know you want to. Search the Last Looks podcast on Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok, whichever one tickles your fancy. And a massive shout out to the husband, Brett Stanley. Without his patience and tech support, this whole podcast situation simply does not happen and cheers to Liliana Rose for her fabulous voice acting talents okay last looks crew that's a wrap for me I don't need to be told twice to get out of here so bye I'll catch you on the flip side